We recently received an email wondering how do you use the main functions in the control surface for the controller in Ableton Live. So this is going to be a demo video that explains that and gives you an overview. We've done a lot of videos about the steppers, but we haven't gone into great detail about how to use the main set for controlling volumes, triggering clips, and navigating your session. First thing we'll want to do is go to our preferences and make sure we have our controller selected as a control surface. I have a slightly different name because I'm using a development version. Then make sure your input and output for the control surface are the controller controls. If you want to be able to record MIDI, for example for drum racks, or use the remote control features with MIDI Learn Maps, you'll want to enable these ports for the controller for input and output. If you just want to use the script without those, you can disable those. Let's take a look at how we have these different buttons and sliders and knobs assigned to different functions in live. We have master volume here and pre hear volume, and our return channels are assigned to these two sliders for an A and B return. So for the most part, these are dedicated to this right hand section of live. The knobs above, you can imagine them being stacked up over the other knobs as they serve as EQ extensions for the four channels that are in your session view. We can go ahead and start the transport with the transport controls in the bottom right, uh, stop, we can arm recording, and we have the session view zoom so we can easily navigate to different areas of our set. We also have left, right, up and down navigation for just going over one cell at a time within the session view. Now let's take a look at triggering some clips. I can trigger this clip and trigger another one. And I can stop the clips using the blank buttons in the grid, or I can use the stop all clips buttons down here on this section. I can go ahead and start these clips again. And if we go over to the far left, we have the solo buttons assigned to the top and we have mutes assigned just below that, mirroring their arrangement in live. We also have volumes, so I can go ahead and start playback, and we'll concentrate on this first track. We have volume control here, pan controls, and we have our send A and B for this channel. Bring up the return volumes. I have some VST plugin effects. Send A on track one, and we can hear the effects start to take place. In both my return channels, I have the same VST plugin on different presets. Uh, this is a spectral delay from SoundHack. Uh, they provide some pretty wild sounds, so it seems appropriate for return. So I can go ahead and send all of the volume. I'll just turn these up. And if those start getting too much, then I can use the send resets that I have on these four buttons here. So we can get those knobs activated again and we can hear what happens when I press those buttons. Taking a look at the right hand side here we have the EQs that match up with the low, mid, and high EQs. Now of course in your Ableton track you'll need to have an EQ effect assigned to that track. Otherwise, these EQ knobs won't do anything. If there was no EQ, they wouldn't work, so these would be free for user mapping if you wanted. Now let's take a look at device control. We have all of these devices lined up in this track, and as we highlight them, we can see that our encoder LED rings are changing to match the value. I can use the encoder buttons to navigate to different devices. We can also use the device bank navigation if we have an effect that has a lot of parameters that we need to reach with these eight knobs. So I can go ahead and modify these, which are changing the knobs in this vocoder, and then I can use the bank, device bank to affect different parameters in the vocoder. And then, of course, this button will disable the effect entirely, which is a nice toggle switch where we want to quickly bring effects in and out. So I can navigate over to the auto filter and engage that and disengage it. 
So you can see we have full effect controls with these eight encoders and their navigation buttons. We have full control over all of our effects in our session. Now we can take a look at the mod buttons on these top encoders. Normally these are used to engage with the drum stepper or synth stepper Max for Live plugins that work with the controller, but you may not have Max for Live or you may not care. So you can use these to make your own custom mappings with MIDI Learn. Now pressing on one of the encoder buttons will hand the controller over to the custom MIDI Learn maps that you set up in these four channels. While we can access it with the device control, sometimes you just want to have a fixed mapping so you know what knobs and what buttons do at any given time. So let's go ahead and try a custom mapping. We can turn on MIDI Learn, and we'll want to assign some of these encoders and buttons to, say, this filter delay that we have in this track. So I'll go ahead and click on some of these feedback controls for the filter delay and the toggle on off and subscribe these encoders and this button to those controls. I can now exit Minimap and we have fixed controls over these feedback knobs and the filter delay on off. And now we can go back to our session control and we can trigger clips and we still have our mappable uh, device controls on these encoders and access the parameters that way. Or of course we can go to our fixed mapping. With four banks of user mappings, you can totally extend the automated mappings that are really convenient but may not be exactly what you want at a particular situation. So you got to get the best of both worlds by using these user assignable slots up here. There's one other feature that is relevant to these user mappings, and that's playing the drums with the controller's 4x4 grid. Of course, in the main setup, these are dedicated to triggering clips, but they also lend themselves to triggering sounds in a drum rack. We can use the user mapping to achieve that. I'll navigate to the far end of my live session where I have a drum rack set up and we can examine this feature more completely. We'll select that and solo it. What I have here is a controller to drum rack MIDI effect and this is downloadable from our website. And what this does is it takes the MIDI notes that are coming from the 4x4 which by default are arranged in columns from note 1 to note 16 and translates them into notes that the drum rack will more easily understand from note 36, 37, 38, all the way up to note 52. And that's going to be arranged from the bottom up in rows rather than the top down columns. You can see that I have track set up so that I can get the MIDI coming in. And if we take a look at the I.O. in our channel strip, we can see that we have MIDI coming from all in. We know MIDI is going to come in. We're going to use the second mod slot for this, and that's going to be coming in on channel 3. So we can restrict this to just channel 3. And we'll enter that module slot. And because we have the controller to drum rack MIDI effect, it's intercepting the MIDI and remapping it to the drums. I also have a delay effect on this track, so we can use the MIDI mapping to map to the on off for the filter delay. We may want to change that with some encoders. So now we have a drum kit with effects nicely mapped out according to our custom needs. Now I can turn the delay off, I can turn it on and play my drums, and we get a really playable custom outfit here. And of course, we can always go back to our full control over the session. There's another feature here. We have the pitch shift that we can then shift the incoming MIDI to access different areas of our drum rack. Now we can take a look at integrating this with our clips. So we can go back to our main control surface 
and navigate over to our first part of the tracks, uh, tracks one through four, and I can trigger some clips and get those going and then just drop into my custom MIDI map with my drums and just start playing and add those sounds to my mix. So you can see this is another nice feature of using the MIDI maps, not just for controlling effects and doing other things, but then you can actually play an instrument using the MIDI effect and drum rack. There's nothing particularly non-standard about this effect rack. That's no max for live needed. It's uh, just a perhaps non-standard arrangement of a MIDI effect in a rack. So hopefully this gives you an overview of all of the things you can do with the control surface script within Max for Live without even touching the drum stepper or synth stepper. Even those are a lot of fun, you may not need them or you may not have Max for Live, but you can still get a lot of power out of your controller using it with Ableton Live.